I'm out here today for two reasons. Firstly, I'm revisiting an area that I scouted earlier this spring during my last video, checking all my shooting lanes with the tree stand and determining the best entry and exit routes. Secondly, and a more interest to you guys, I'm gonna explain how I hunt an area by going in blind, both during and outside of the rut, morning and evening, and I'm gonna show some immensely helpful GPS strategies. Going in blind is almost never as good of an option as hunting an area that you've already scouted on foot, but sometimes it's your best bet. If you're on an out of state hunt, oftentimes you don't wanna get your scent everywhere on the first day of your trip, and you don't wanna spend the extra couple hundred dollars in gas just to take a scouting only trip a couple months in advance of the season. In that case, going in blind can be a good option. Now let's say you find a new piece of public land or you get permission to access a new piece of private land during the season or maybe if the season's just around the corner. In that case, rather than get your scent everywhere, going on blind could be a great option. In fact, when I first moved to the Twin Cities, I bounced around quite a bit. I get familiar with a piece of land, do a bunch of preseason scouting, postseason scouting, and then I'd find a new place that I'd rather hunt. And as a result, I did a lot of going in blind type of hunts. Because after midsummer, I don't want to invade the areas that I plan on hunting in the fall. I'd rather the deer have absolutely no idea that anything has changed until it's too late. I can break up going in blind into rut hunts and hunts outside of the rut. I can also break it down into morning and evening hunts, with evening hunts being immensely easier than a morning hunt. That being said, I've probably seen and shot more deer on morning going in blind hunts than probably any other hunting strategy, and I'll give you guys some real world examples. So, outside of the rut, for the most part, deer are gonna be on their bedding and feeding patterns. So, the idea for an afternoon hunt is you wanna get on that trail that goes from the bedding area to the food source and you wanna get as close to the bed as you can get away with without bumping the deer. Now, for a morning hunt, the idea is you don't wanna go on those trails that the deer are gonna to use to get back to their beds. You wanna sneak around the backside, get into that bedding area or very close to it and wait for the deer to come back in the morning. Okay, let's start with an example. So this is a morning hunt. This hunt took place on the opening day of Minnesota's 2012 archery season. This is the place that I hunted, although it did not look like this when I actually went back there. This was taken in the springtime when the river was flooded. What it actually looked like was more like this. The waters had receded and you got these sandy banks on the river. So one thing I know from reading online forums about rivers is that your outside corners will tend to make good funnels and your inside corners of the points tend to make good bedding and if i zoom in on this i can see that it looks like there's a good transition between this smaller brushy stuff and the larger timber so that might indeed hold some bedding and now that i think i know where the bedding is all i have to do is find the food and then pick a spot in between those two so this place doesn't really have much for agriculture so i'm just going to take a wild guess on this one but it's not super critical here because if i assume that the deer are feeding somewhere out on the left here and bedding on this point then i just got to find a place in between those two areas and i'd probably want to set up on this outside bend here because that's a good funnel any deer between you know about this level and about this level i could see getting funneled around this corner on their way to that point. Here's a little bit better picture. This is Bing's bird's eye map, um, but this one was taken back in 2012 before they updated the maps of all the flooding. So this is that same little round piece of timber that you can see on the outside bend of that river. And you can see I got nice transition lines here. I got nice transition lines here. And like I said before, I expect the deer to come from that bottom left and go around that river bank to get to the bedding on that point. So if I set up my tree somewhere in this area and I just, you know, walk in here and just find the best tree in the dark, then I should be able to shoot, you know, based off of the scale, anything inside that open piece of timber. So now that I got the spot picked out, I need to figure out an access. And if it actually looks like what this picture looks like with the sandy beach, that'll make access really easy. So I got a parking lot right down here. I can just walk along the roadside here to get to the beach. And I can just walk this beach all the way up to that outside curve, a little bit past where I want to hang my tree stand, and then walk in and loop back around and hang my stand. 
So on opening morning of the 2012 archery season, I did that exact route, walked in along the sand beach, hung my stand, saw one other flashlight, so I waved him off, and then luckily some of my assumptions were right, because about three minutes after shooting light, a seven point buck walked by. Now, as you guys probably realize, that buck was not huge by any means. So this brings up an important limitation about going in blind. It's easy to pick a bunch of spots that could hold a mature buck on a computer, but as far as which one actually is going to contain it, it's really tough to tell without getting your feet on the ground and doing some actual scouting. So for filling a doe tag or putting some meat in the freezer, going in blind is awesome. It's a great way to put deer on the ground. But as far as getting that mature buck on the ground, it's tough. Just realize that. It can most certainly happen. One, if you get lucky, or two, if you're just hunting on amazing land and there's just a lot of big bucks around. I don't need to introduce you guys to Murphy's Law. Just about every hunter knows about it. And never is it more true than on going in blind in the morning. You can be rest assured of two things. One, if there's an area that has extremely thick brush and then there's an open area right next to it, you won't see that open area and you'll try and bushwhack right through that thick stuff. The second thing you can be sure of is the tree is probably not gonna be as easy to climb as it looks like from the ground in the dark. Maybe there's a branch that's leaning up against the backside and makes it hard to swing your straps around for your climbing sticks. Or maybe the tree starts leaning a little bit. You know, half the time you're dripping in sweat, swearing under your breath and five minutes into legal shooting light by the time you're all ready to go. Just be aware of that, wrap your head around it, because the more mentally prepared you can be for this type of hunt, the less frustrated you're gonna be, the more confident you're gonna be, and ultimately the more successful you're gonna be. Compared to morning hunts, evening hunts going in blind are a cakewalk, because you can actually see what you're doing. Instead of trying to pick an exact tree on the computer, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just pick an area. And then once I actually walk into that area, I'll use my eyes and find the freshest sign, the best tree, and then I'll you know pick that spot to set up. The only other thing you're going to need to be aware of is that if you're hunting close to better deer, you obviously need to move very slow and you got to be very quiet when you set up. If I can hear it, the deer can hear it. That's my rule of thumb. Now, if you are hunting during the rut, you can count on deer moving at any time of the day and you can get away with a lot more. So a lot of times what I like to do instead of going in before it gets light out and sitting dark to dark is I'll walk in during that period of gray light so I can actually see what I'm doing. And a lot of times I find that I pick a lot better tree doing that and I don't usually have to worry about missing an opportunity because I wasn't in the tree early enough. The other thing that's kind of nice is that it's not nearly as mentally draining as it is sitting dark to dark. So here's an example of a rut hunt. I would show you guys the aerial photo, but it's pretty much useless because this is big woods and it honestly looks all exactly the same. So I'll just show you the topo map, which is actually what I used at the time. I was hunting down here on the edge of a swamp by a river valley and I was just, you know, bored in the morning looking at my GPS, which had the topo lines on it. And I know I wanted to get to a spot that had higher elevation, but I had not really traveled to any of this woods before. And I found this spot right here that looked nice. So it's got a ravine coming up here. And anytime you're hunting during the rut, ravines can be nice terrain funnels. And the other thing about this ravine is it's really close to this little piece of marsh right here. So when I look at that, I see that as kind of a double funnel. The deer like this transition line at the edge of that marsh, and they're also gonna to wanna to travel around the top side of that ravine. So I'm thinking right in here would be a good place to hang a stand. So later that morning, I took my stand down, walked over to this area, hung my stand, ended up seeing one four corner at night, but I liked the spot a lot. So I went in the next morning, and then that's where I shot this buck. The GPS that I use right now and really have used for the past several years is the Garmin GPS Map 62S. I would have gotten the 62ST, but I got a heck of a deal on the 62S. And if you go to gpsfiledepot.com, you can actually download free topo maps for a lot of areas. So, for example, I used to do a lot of hunting in Wisconsin. I can go search Wisconsin, and I can find this Wisconsin topo public lands landowner names, plat data, and I think the one that I actually downloaded first was Wisconsin Topo, and it gives you that transparent topo lines. Yeah, there you go, there's an example. So it gives you these lines and it just overlays over the information that's already on your GPS, so it really works out pretty awesome, and it's free. I plan on downloading the Colorado version when I go out west elk hunting this fall. Another really cool thing you can do with Garmin GPSs at least, I'm not sure if it works with other brands, is to 
actually overlay an image onto your GPS. So right now I'm using Bing.com's aerial view and I can hit print screen on my computer and I can go into Microsoft Paint, paste that with the control V and then I can just crop out the section of the image that I want. So I'll just crop this right here, hit crop and then I'll save this as a JPEG. It's very important that you save it as a JPEG because if you don't save it as a JPEG, this probably won't work. And within Google Earth, I can go to the area that I took that screenshot of with Bing.com Maps, and I can hit this little icon right here that looks like a transparent piece of paper on top of a blue piece of paper. If I hit that, it prompts me to add an image. So I can browse for that image, Map 1, and look at that, it adds the image to the ground. So now what I have to do is drop the opacity on this so I can see through it. And this is where if you have an image that has lakes or hard transition lines or roads, it makes this task a lot easier. Because you see right here this road, I can line these two up. And I can drag in the corners to resize the image and then move around in the center to get it where I want. Can line up these little islands of trees. There. That looks pretty close. Okay, so now what I can do is hit OK. All you have to do is go to the image on the sidebar here. You can rename it if you want. Um, but all I'm going to do here is click Save Place As and I'm just going to save it as you know, map2 and save it as a KMZ file. Save it. And then when you plug in your GPS to the computer via the USB cable, you can go into Garmin, Custom Maps, and then you can drag and drop that KMZ file into the folder. And that's it. That's all you got to do. Now the next time you turn on the GPS, this map will appear on the background. And if you have those topo lines, they'll appear right over the top of it. Now here's a trick you guys are going to find useful. It's going to be drawing a route on the computer and then sending it to your GPS so that you can follow that route and find a new spot completely in the dark if you need to. So I'm going to start in Google Earth here. I'm going to draw a path. Let's start this parking lot. And just so you guys can see this a little bit better, boost the width. Of this line okay so let's keep drawing I can see a trail it looks like it jumps up this way I can see that it goes right here it looks like there's a bridge comes back down through here and let's say you want to follow this all the way down here and you want to hang your stand right out here <clears throat> it's a pretty long walk you can check the measurements right now you can see that's about two and a half miles but let's say you're fine with that, so hit OK. And on this untitled path that I just created here, I'm going to save this place as a KML file. And I'll call it path1. Save it on the desktop for now. Now I can open up Garmin Basecamp, which is a free software that you can download. And I know that that spot I just created was right in here. Okay, make this full screen. I can take that KML path. And I can drop it onto this My Collection folder right here. And now you can see it added that path. Okay, right down here in My Collection, I can rename this if I want to. I'll rename it to Path 1. This is like the breadcrumb track that your GPS would normally create when you walk a route. If you want to make it an actual route instead of a track, then you can just create a route from the selected track. Enter number of points. Well, what it has right now looks pretty good. We'll say 25. Got to unselect, choose the number of points automatically. Put in 25. And now it just created this route. I don't need this track anymore, so I can delete that. 
Now we just have this route. Plug your GPS into the computer and it'll show up under the devices on Basecamp. So now to get this route onto your GPS, all you gotta do, click this little button right here that says send my collection to device. Select your unit, hit OK. And that's it, you can see it working here. Data is successfully sent. Now when you open up your GPS, you'll just click on Find, click on Routes, and then you'll find that Path 1. And then it'll start you right here and you'll be able to follow that route all the way to your stand, even if it's pitch black and you've never been there before. It's really nice.